Hello. Welcome to this, the last Hymn Society webinar of our very first webinar series. Mike said he wanted this to kind of be like a uh, like a talk show, since it's a panel discussion. <laughs> so I found some of my best talk show background music. So if you're not familiar with the webinar format, the webinar format is a little different than the meeting format. You can dance, no one can see you, because the only people that can be seen are the panelists. <laughs> But there are ways you can interact. There are, there is the chat. The chat works the same way. You can put questions in the chat if you like. You can talk to each other. There are two ways to use the chat. You can chat to everyone or just the panelists. And then there's the Q&A. You can put in your question. If you have a question you want the panelists to chew on together. And then you can upvote. So if you see a question that you really love, you can do what's called an upvote. And that means it'll be higher in the queue and more likely to be answered by the panelists. And now introducing your host for today, <laughs> Mike McMahon, executive director of the Hymn Society. He's got degrees from all sorts of places in theology. He's worked for all sorts of people. He is an ordained minister in the Disciples of Christ, and he is now your executive director. Wow, what an introduction. I have never been introduced more beautifully than that, Brian. Thank you so much. Well, welcome, everybody. It's great to be with you today for this webinar that we're calling uh, Singing as the Journey Continues. And um, we know that um, this past year has been, been a year, right? It's been uh, an amazing and difficult time, uh, but uh, it seems like this is a good point for us to sort of reflect on what's been going on uh, for, for us over the past year, and also to reflect on where we're going to be going from here on out, because uh, we're sort of at a transition point where uh, things are going to be changing drastically. As Brian said, uh, the only people who can be seen and heard on this webinar are the panelists, whom I'll be introducing in a moment, but we do want you to take part in this and an active part in this, so please do feel free to uh, write your questions in the Q&A or to make comments in the chat for, for us to see or for everybody to see or for particular panelists to see. Um, so this year we've had this pandemic that has isolated us. It's uh, you know caused more than two and a half million infections worldwide. Uh, it's I guess an extra two and a half million deaths worldwide. Um, it's been disruptive to our churches, our communities, our, our workplaces. Uh, it's caused major disruption all around us, and it's been a challenge for, for our churches. Uh, also during the past year, uh, we uh, witnessed the killing of George Floyd by police in Minneapolis. And uh, right now we're watching that trial every day. And it reminds us of the killing of other uh, people of color by police uh, during the past years and um, the movements that it spawned. We saw lots of uh, demonstrations last spring. Uh, we saw uh, a surge in Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations in various cities. Um, just last week, I was down in downtown Washington and, and for the first time, I actually got to stand in Black Lives Matter Plaza and uh, recall what's, what's been going on down there. And of course, also this past here in the United States, we had a, a very uh, difficult uh, campaign, election campaign. Uh, we saw an effort to overturn that election. Uh, we've seen lots of polarization during, before, after that election. So we've got lots of things that have been going on this past year, and I, I'm really glad to welcome uh, this panel to talk, have a conversation about all that's been going on and uh, all that we, uh, the kinds of challenges that we're facing going forward. So I'm gonna introduce them and ask them each to wave at you uh, as I do so. Uh, first, we have the Reverend Dr. Cynthia A. Wilson. She is Executive Director uh, for Worship Resources at Discipleship Ministries, the United Methodist Church, and, and she is located in Nashville, Tennessee. And she is a former um, executive committee member uh, of the Hymn Society. So that's where I got really first to know and appreciate uh, the gifts that she brings. Uh, also uh, from uh, Toronto, Matthew Buda, who is uh, director of music at Side United Church. And he's also uh, the assistant conductor of the Pax Christi Chorale uh, there in, in Toronto. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Tan 
is professor of Catholic studies at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. And on the weekends, he is the organist and director of music at the Episcopal Church of Our Savior in Cincinnati. So he sees a lot of Ohio every week. And uh, we have Kate Williams, who is the senior managing editor at GIA Publications in Chicago, and who's also involved at the local level and at the national level in, in church matters too, and uh, works in Roman Catholic setting. So welcome to all of you. I am so, so glad to have this opportunity to speak with you about uh, where we've been and where we're going. So I, I'd like to start a conversation with Cynthia Wilson, um, as Director of Worship Resources for an entire denomination. Um, I'm wondering what you're hearing uh, from people who are serving churches about this past year. There are so many emotions attached to the journey uh, from 12 to 14 months ago. Uh, those emotions range from sadness, depression, um, just lament, missing uh, the opportunities to fellowship with uh, colleagues and cohorts, um, being able to do coffee hour, that's a big one for local churches, um, no matter what the denomination. Uh, that's a major community builder and, and place for fellowship and, and is ex establishing and experiencing unity and community. So people have just been missing the fellowship and the opportunities uh, to be in touch and in tune with each other. And there's a level of intimacy that happens um, when people are able to gather uh, not just in their local churches, but in the supermarket or out in the parking lot. Uh, so uh, those those regular everyday um, everyday things that we were accustomed to doing prior to the world closing, uh, folks have just missed out on those simple things, the simple pleasures. At the same time. Um, there have been uh, celebrations of how people have been able to, to move around this pandemic and to move around the various uh, protocols that were established uh, in life in general. Um, parents have had to be extremely creative uh, because they've had to, to wear six and seven hats, work, children, babysitter. Uh, so. It's, it's been fun listening to and watching how people have been creative about keeping their, holding their families together, making sure that their children have had what they needed. Choir directors have bemoaned the fact that they've not been able to bring together their singers, but at the same time, they've had to find ways to keep in touch. And those ways didn't always include, uh, do not always include singing. Uh, I really was impressed by one of my colleagues who brought together every Wednesday, uh, all of the singers in the parking lot. They parked their cars and uh, they, they, they had um, microphones uh, so that they were able to uh, sing and hear each other. And then they would do devotional periods and they would take turns leading these devotions and sharing. So it's, it's just been fun listening to not only the pain and the sorrow, uh, but to listen to the celebration of the creativity. Uh, that yeah, it's fun. interesting. S both sadness and opportunities that people yes, have uh, absolutely. been out to. Thank yeah. you. Jo Jonathan Tan, I was wondering, uh, you, you serve as a music director for a, a multicultural church community, a very interesting, interesting one. And I'm, I'm wondering uh, how this year has affected uh, the life of your community and what you're, what you're seeing. So uh, thank you, Mike, for inviting me. You know, uh, for those of you who are not aware, I serve as organist and director of music at the Church of Our Savior, La Iglesia de Nuestro Salvador. It's an Episcopal uh, urban Cincinnati uh, parish that is primarily Latino, so about 60% Latino, 30% African American, and 10% white and others. So it is the complete opposite of most Episcopal parishes. 
So uh, at the start of COVID, I think what we realized because uh, our demographics, we are primarily Latino. So uh, primarily refugees, asylum seekers, undocumented. You know. So uh, many of whom coming to church is also familiar, it's also comunidad, you know, family and community. The, the, you know, for those of you who serve in Latino parishes, whether Catholic or otherwise, you know, the the it is coming to church is not just sacramental, it is also a way to gather people. And I think COVID struck at that, you know, to realize the the loss of that uh, human relationships. Of course, to make matters worse, you know, uh, for many parishes, going live stream was an option and we and we did live stream too. But then we realized that the majority, in fact, most of our Latino parishioners cannot access live stream because they don't have internet at home. Or if they have internet, it's on their mobile phone or it's limited. So no YouTube live stream. In fact, we have so much difficulties even getting the kids online for for their school uh, because you know most families do not have the kind of broadband internet at home if anything it's just on your mobile phone it's just 3g limited data plans and you know, all that kind of stuff so uh and that serve you know then we realize how much we take for granted doing church in person and having to go uh online uh, uh it was not as easy as just offering live stream and then expect people to log in watch a youtube live stream or participate on zoom uh we had zoom uh prayer meetings we had uh youtube but then we realized that that most of our parishioners cannot do that so uh so we had our first in-person uh bilingual mass uh for easter sunday and it was just so exciting you know we you know we packed the church uh subject to physical distancing and it was so good to see everyone back and you know everyone express you know uh what they have missed for one whole year the, the ability to, to to gather together uh but then we also realized that we have quite a number of older folks for whom COVID meant that they, they could not safely go to church. So watching from their nursing homes or retirement homes when they used to when we used to bus them to church. So uh, they were able to watch on YouTube. So so it seems that we learned that going forward we probably need a hybrid church where it's in person as well as live stream. Mm -hmm. uh, we are just trying to figure out you know the, the me mechanics of doing that but it has uh, given us new opportunities we have gotten uh, people from around the country who who now uh, watch us every week who probably would not have seen us because you know who who looks for an inner city uh, intercultural bilingual parish in the middle of the midwest but because of covid people are interested to see how folks are doing church differently so it is both a challenge as well as an opportunity yeah, you know, I'm really struck by uh, your comments about um, the challenges to um, to a community that's accustomed to close physical closeness. Uh, you know, th it's even more challenging for a Latino community, perhaps, than 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 some other cultural groups, and also the uh, the economic disadvantage that a lot of communities have experienced uh, in this pandemic because of their um, in, the access to. Uh, to uh, technology, so thank you for that. Uh, I, I want to uh, bring in Matthew, who so he's our Canadian here, and uh, uh, I, I, I think it'd be good to hear Canadian perspective on on, on the experience, uh, and um, also your community. I think is uh, rather different from uh, from Jonathan's in that you're primarily a, a white uh, community. So I, I'm wondering what that's been like for your community and also kind of the role of singing uh, in, in uh, facing the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's constant changes here. Um, you know, just as of yesterday, we, you know, we're over a thousand cases right now. Um, we're in our third wave lockdown, stay at home order. Um, the vaccine rollouts have been slower. And um, and so it's a it's a unique situation uh, for, for for where we are right now um, in, in Lee side. Um, 
at the moment, you know, just before the pandemic, we were planning to have a full year renovation uh, for 2020. Um, and so they, the Karangans and, and, and the members were all kind of um, prepared in a way to, to be away from their building space. And in that sense, um, knowing that we would be worshiping somewhere else was the, was the hope at the moment. And so, um, but then little did we know, you know, we're, we're now in a pandemic. Um, but yeah, there, there, there's been some, some grief and, and, uh, you know, we lost a couple of members due to COVID itself and not having a space at the moment as well to, to do any kind of in-person or, or the ability to do any in-person kind of a funeral or, you know, that end of life uh, care. Um, and so to move everything virtual, it's been um, a different process to, to offer these, um, you know, services, and, and, you know, and, and care virtually. And, and so there's been some unique aspects in that front. And um, in terms of singing, um, so at the moment, we don't have any in-person um, uh, worship services, everything since the start of uh, September, um, everything has been virtual. So we kind of, so whether, regardless of any changes or anything, we just did everything virtually. So at least we were, we all knew that, you know, because there were so many things that were changing, you know, kids, uh, you know, things are opening up, things are closing. And that was changing quite often. We, we thought, let's just uh, do everything virtually. And so at least we were all, um, you know, aware, uh, uh, you know, that nothing would affect that aspect. Um, and so when it came to singing, um, you know, leading congregational singing, uh, you know, on through your screens virtually, our services are held on both uh, Zoom and YouTube. Um, and, you know, we have our coffee hour as well on Zoom. Um, but yeah, so we have we have a soloist who um, leads our hymn singing and, I, and I'm usually accompanying. Interestingly, we do this uh, virtually, so I record the uh, hymn accompaniments, and they kind of record their uh, the, their voice on top of that, and um, and that's how we've been trying to share um, music, and and it's been kind of interesting in that sense as well, right? This kind of you know, as the singer themselves, you know, this this more soloistic recording artist kind of nature, and just the way worship is at the moment, it's just very hyper focused online too. You know, you don't have the, the stained glass windows or hearing um, or someone to just whisper to, you know, in a service or something. It's just, here's what's in front of you in a sense. And things are a bit more hyper-focused, but um, still trying to figure out ways to encourage congregational song online, you know, through a screen um, is, is always something we're working on. Sometimes we feel as leaders that, um, we're kind of like the performers and, you know, the congregants kind of feel like they're receiving as the audience. So how can we encourage them? They are the actors in this, right? And, and how can we get that participation up? And so that, that, that's something we're always trying to encourage, um, even virtually. So, yeah. Hey, thank you, Matthew. Kate, so you, you're GIA. And uh, I know that this has been a very tough year for uh, publishers. And, uh, you know, we've been thinking about you. Uh, but you're also at the crossroads of of uh, people who are doing music in all kinds of different ways. So, you know, I'm I'm, I'm wondering what 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 you're hearing and uh, what you're seeing out there. Yeah, you're absolutely right. This has been a tough year for publishers, especially music publishers. Um, you know, particularly our our two bases for customers are uh, schools and churches, and the first two things to shut down were schools and churches. Um, and we still, you know, in most places cannot sing or the ones who can sing are just very, very limited. So especially in a, a publisher that, that specializes in congregational singing and um, choral singing, um, that's a bit like, you know, the, the rug pulled out from, from under us, just like it is for everybody, for everybody else. So we've done our best to really um, be reaching out and trying to listen to music directors and music makers and teachers um, and find out where exactly they are um, and, and try to meet them there. So that meant for us, like making all as many of our resources as possible digitally available, especially at the beginning of the pandemic when we weren't really sure like how, how these things were traveling, um, you know, on a, a physical product. So some people were, you know, afraid to get things in the mail because they didn't know if that was safe or, or hygienic. Um, so that increased um, availability, accessibility towards digital resources became increasingly important. Um, and then, you know, uh, also in my role both as a, a, a musician, a music minister, and as a publisher, this has been, you know, a, a year of really layered and complicated griefs, one on top of another. Um, and so, 
uh, you know, that has been just additionally challenging for us. It's, it's meant that rather than just, just respond to the, um, the challenge of, uh, of COVID-19, um, we're trying to respond to, to, you know, the church's role or perhaps um, music's role in kind of an inflamed environment, sometimes quite literally inflamed, right? I remember on Pentecost Sunday watching most of you know, parts of Minneapolis in, engulfed in flames. And really that was too, uh, even the West Coast was struggling with a lot of uh, wildfire. Um, and so there's been a lot of complicated grief. Um, Excuse me, can, but, can I interrupt you for just one moment? I, I'm hearing typing in the background, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, we're hearing it over over your, your talking. So I just wanted to, but you know, please go ahead. Sure. Um, and so you know, in this in this time of just increased grieving for everyone, everybody's also bringing their their regular selves and their hopes and anxieties and and beings, and then not having a place, a community like they're used to to bring them to. And so a lot of my role as a music minister has, has really been um, uh, more like a, a, a grief counselor or a listener or a friend, or um, there's a lot of healing that I think has been needed over these past, uh, over this past year, but really so much more that will be needed even as we climb our, our way out of this um, pandemic, because there's um, just as a means of survival, we've not been able to um, properly unpack those griefs, I think, like we normally would. And, and, you know, us as musicians, we're used to singing and music making being a part of that, that grief unpacking. And so there's a lot more of that, I think, I think to come. And I think the other thing that I'm, I'm just mindful of is as we continue to navigate all of these uh, compound um, griefs, uh, is how many things have come to light in our disconnect from one another, um, whether it be really broken healthcare systems or um, just an, uh, an acute awareness of what, what poverty means, especially when we can't physically be present to one another and what types of um, opportunities that robs people of that we, you know, a lot of us can remain, um, you know, pretty, uh, unaware of most of the time and now we're, we're aware of it in, in much different and, and uh, comprehensive ways. Um, different abuses that have come to light in, in this time of, of disconnect from one another. And it makes me realize how much work we have left to do, but also trying to be mindful of just how much dark we were living in um, when we kept ourselves busy and perhaps um, a little bit shielded by a facade of, of community and togetherness that um, when we, when that has been taken from us, you know, kind of look what's, look what's behind this curtain. So it's been a very complicated and, and complex time, but I think for all of us in different ways. Wow. That is really, um, I think so important for us to pay attention to the, uh, the um, things that have been going on uh, that now need to be dealt with. And uh, I'm wondering, Cynthia Wilson, if you're, you're seeing that too. And you know, what, what you're seeing is then the challenge for, for musicians and pastors and you know, song leaders. Now, now, how do we begin to work with people to unpack that and, and uh, deal with it? Name it. You know, today I've been I've really been thinking a lot today about the, the 137th Psalm. Uh, it has really been haunting me. Um, by the rivers of Babylon, we wept, mm -hmm. and um, and they asked the question, but how how will we see? And I think the the follow up question is, and what? on earth will we sing? Well, coming out of a culture, uh, an oral tradition, uh, the need for um, instruments was historically not that great because of the richness and the legacy of that tradition. So in some contexts, the, the idea of not having an organ or or not having a piano or whatever hasn't really 
really been that um, dire. Um, at the same time, uh, the psalmist says, so we hung up our harps. We just, we just put them away on um, the trees. And we took some time to remember. I, and I think that musicians are being forced now to, to remember some things, uh, to remember how it is that you put a song in the mouths of the people, the congregation, to remember the role of the congregation in worship, uh, to remember how it is that uh, we are are able to empower the voices of the people so that worship and that work really is restored in the hearts and the bellies uh, of the worshipers. And so the, the song uh, is a song possibly of, a, of remembrance. And as we said just a moment ago, a song of, of lament. So musicians have had to reach back. They've had to remember, they have had to not only remember, but they've had to be more inclusive about the ways in which singing functions in worship. I am um, a, a choral director as well as a, a singer. So it, the, the choir's voice is really gold to me, but at the same time, I recognize more, more clearly as we have attempted at the Board of Discipleship to give ideas, to give some, uh, uh, some credence to the ways in which in the richness uh, of, the, of, of the folk as they virtually participate. We've done a lot from the board. We've done a lot of virtual choirs. And it's been a joy watching people in their homes dance and sing and clap and enjoy uh, the ways in which worship can function and worship can be vital, even in, in the home. And it's been a joy watching the ways in which people in different states and in different places connect, even virtually. Uh, so musicians have had to be inclusive. They've had to, re to remember how to connect people. They have, and then of course, um, I don't know if, if, if you all are, are familiar with the, the Sankofa bird. Uh, the Sankofa bird comes from Ghana. Uh, the word itself is a Yoruba, a Yoruba word, but that bird flies forward, but it looks back. I think musicians have had to learn how to keep moving. And although it's good to remember uh, it's not necessarily so good to keep looking back. It's good to reach back and learn from what was, but th there is a, a richness about being able to keep moving and, and keep looking forward. So there's some learnings uh, that we have had to uh, take advantage of uh, as musicians, as worship leaders, even as pastors, uh, we've learned some things. And we've had to remember those things. But now we're having to figure out where we're going and how we're gonna get there. And what shall we say to these things? So the song itself ought to be, yes, repeating history, but yes, speaking to what is to come, what will be. Uh, Langston Hughes said, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. That is so real in my sanctified soul, it's real. Uh, but how do we sing a welcome? when uh, you're so accustomed uh, to singing with someone? How do you, how do you make that live? Uh, there are some, there, the, the uh, civil rights movement uh, used the medium of music, right? And that music functioned as a conveyor belt. It kept the folk moving. Uh, that's, that's what, uh, that's, that's the mission and that's, that's the, the way in which we can keep the legacy and the aliveness and the vitality of what worship ought to be and what it ought to look like both now and, and in years to come, I think. We don't, I, I think what we've learned as worship leaders, as musicians, what, what we've learned is that we really don't have to have a building, right? right. We've, we've really worked it out without having so, to be inside of a building. Yeah. yeah. 
so you you've really put us in touch with um, like what Kate was talking about, you know, they, naming the darknesses and looking back on on things that we've experienced, but then also moving forward with that. So, uh, like Matthew, in 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 your church, you also mentioned people dying and uh, some difficult to. Uh, have gathered the community to uh, mark those events, yeah. you know, to, to name the, the things that have happened. So how do you see yourselves moving forward as, uh, as, as we, you know, as things progress? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are definitely a lot of families that are still like, you know, once uh, things are under control and we're not in a sense like in a pandemic, we'd like to, you know, have a, a, surf, a service uh, remembering this person's life. Um, and so there's been a lot of people that have been, um, would rather somehow have it in person. And so we're holding that um, for them. And um, at the moment, we're always just reaching out, um, you know, we uh, in, in little ways, whether we are mailing little things or giving them a call just to continue to connect with them. Um, I, I know uh, just a couple of service ago, we, we, uh, one of the members, they, they were remembering their husband of one year. Um, at, at the per, he passed away just two weeks uh, in March of last year. And so uh, we, we offer them a service in remembrance, you know, with music that um, he, he really enjoyed and he was in touch with and that included hymns as well as other music uh, as well and so it, ways to kind of honor and um, remember and you know through this grief process at the moment it's virtual and they're still we're still definitely looking forward to when we can host these um, gatherings in person again um, because it's quite a community where people just all want to be there at once yeah. in a sense so we're, we're waiting for that. Oh, thanks. Jonathan, I was wondering in, in the Latino community, um, how are people singing the songs of lament and, uh, and, and, and hope at the same time? Well, our community, uh, because we have quite a number of undocumented refugees, asylum seekers, and ever since Biden came to power, uh, came into office, I know, uh, we have had a huge influx of uh, new arrivals who crossed the border and then they are resettled here uh, and so for us you know uh, uh, our communities uh, it's a bit different in the sense that uh, you know our, uh, most of our communities are uh, indigenous mayans uh, from guatemala and Hon honduras and for whom Spanish is not even their first language, is uh, Mim or some other indigenous Mayan languages. Uh, what, and, and for them, the, the, the primary mode of survival is they survive crossing the border. They were relocated by ICE here because of existing family ties. So for us, doing church is not even it's even more basic than just providing music or the Sunday mass or the kind of stuff uh, is to try to give them food, try to settle them, find documentation, make sure the cops got Ohio being conservative, don't harass them or arrest them because they don't have the paperwork while they are being processed through the system. Uh, just because under Biden, they can come in. Doesn't doesn't mean that the conservative Republican administration and the police and the sheriffs will not harass them. You know, it's a, you know so so we, we deal with that. And but for these people, it's very different. So for them, it's not lament. The fact that they survive crossing the Rio Grande, crossing the border, the desert, you know, uh, the coyotes and all the kind of stuff is celebration. Uh, so, so how are you expressing that in so, worship? So in I mean so what we have done is because for a lot of these people they don't even watch our YouTube live stream so we do audio podcasts they listen to it while they work uh, you know uh, headphones and stuff you know files that they can download uh, on small clips you know so we are going even far more basic you know uh, than YouTube live stream because these people you know you know uh, MP3 files that can be shared easily that they can listen while they work. Uh, because many of them work in Amazon warehouses or in hospitality hotels as cleaning staff that they can listen. Uh, uh, for many of them, uh, uh, you know, in terms of music, you know, Latin, Latino music, as you know, is not meant to be done as a solo performance. It's always a community effort. 
So what we have done is, you know, we, we, we just record instrumental tracks and they can sing along to it. We don't even we don't even do soloists. So so very very often that even now because we even even for Easter Sunday when we have our in person, uh, uh, because of the diocesan mandate, uh, because we are still quite high, so we we just provide instrumental music, no singing, but you know people at home who watch, people who listen, can sing because they have familiar sound. They can sing on their own. You know uh, we have what we have done is deliberately chosen songs that everybody knows so nothing new nothing unusual nothing that requires a big fancy choir but but the songs that the community knows they can sing by heart uh and i, I think getting back to the basics mm -hmm. so for them so they can celebrate so so uh so i i think it, it shows you know, the 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 different demographics because we, as our parish we, we never had fancy choirs or the kind of uh, uh, you know performance style uh, liturgies to begin with. It was uh, we we don't even have a standing choir in our parish, uh, so it's, the singing has always been done by the community. The music I pick are music that the community knows how to sing. Uh, uh, right. So it's very it's a very different, I suppose, from other parishes. So you you one of the things you've raised is some of the technological challenges of serving different kinds of communities. Uh, so, for example, uh, people who are uh, working in blue collar jobs uh, and a limited income are not sitting in nice offices like mine here uh, on their Zoom calls. Uh, so I, I, Brian raised this question sort of in a more global sense about um, now that we, uh, you know, we were also talking about going forward doing hybrid formats uh, for worship uh, on, on Sundays. Um, which is uh, going to create a lot more work for staff and volunteers and wondering what are the, what are the ramifications of those increased expectations you think uh, uh, going forward, Kate? Yeah, financial ramifications <laughs> and uh, burnout yeah. ramifications, I think are the top two, the top of my mind. Um, because all of these new skills that people have been expected and really have been quite courageous and ingenious about acquiring the skills to do Zoom and to do virtual choirs and to, to podcast or live stream or whatever is working for their community. It's really been quite remarkable to see that come together so quickly and creatively. Um, but it, you know, it has a cost. I think all of those new ways of being connected have had a cost. And I mean that financially, and I mean that, um, the cost of, you know, the sacrifices that I think mu musicians, music makers, parishes, uh, churches have had to pay, um, you know, it meant more hours working. It meant more time away from or, you know, distracted from their family time for a lot of people. And, um, you know, a lot of um, music directors I know, uh, you know, have been expected to do more and even with less. So a lot of people have either been downsized in their jobs or have lost their jobs altogether. Um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that one way uh, GIA has been able to respond is to try to make as many things as possible free and easy. So last year when, um, you know, when we were approaching Easter and it looked so different and nobody knew exactly what Cynthia was talking about, like what song do we sing? or invite people into singing in the midst of so much unexpected chaos. Um, and so there was this wonderful um, Benjamin Brody song, Christ Still Rises, um, uh, that, that we were made available for free. And that was a gift both of the, the composer and the text author as, as much as it was from GIA. Like, we want you to sing, we wanna help. I think this might be an answer um, let it not cost you. <laughs> let let us share some of the you know the financial burden there, and just make it easy, make it accessible to you. You can download it immediately. Um, like um, you know, Hymn Society, we've also been trying to do you know a number of webinars throughout the year as well to keep people connected, to give people that um, you know a little bit of that fellowship vibe, as much as you know professional development, and really just a a place to try to find hope again. Um, amongst, you know, even sharing those, those burdens that we've all been carrying and feeling so isolated with. Um, 
so and, and to do that in a pla in place of you know if people can't attend a conference that they're normally ex uh, you know used to attending. I know last year the Hymn Society's virtual offering of a convention was just so phenomenal and really just a relief for people to know that they could still be connected and they could still find some kind of anchor to kind of get them through this this time. So offerings like that have been super important. But you know, then um, there's a, a liturgical composers forum I know that started a, a fund called As Music Heals um, that was specifically um, geared towards raising money um, to support musicians that had lost their jobs, church workers that had lost um, their 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 jobs. And that, you know, really that's exactly what people needed it sounds almost almost crass but there's no way that the 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 people who were you know less affected by some of the financial ramifications could carry the burden of of everyone what they needed was us to spread around money resources um and lots of shoulders to cry on <laughs> so that we could keep as many players as possible in the game as long as possible um, it seems like moving forward, there's going to be, there's so many demands now on, on musicians and pastors and song leaders, because I've heard just in our conversation today, we talked about some of the, you know, pastoral issues of dealing with people's stuff. Uh, and at the same time, I hear musical challenges of creating musical experiences for people and worship experiences for people. And then I'm hearing the technological challenges of uh, managing all this in a, both a physical and uh, an online presence. Um, uh, how, how's that sitting with you, Matthew? Uh, you're, 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 you're on the front lines of this. Yeah, um, you know, like just thinking about what we as leaders can offer, um, you know, through this period of absence, I'm just seeing one of the questions pop up as well here about, um, you know, singing from silence to, uh, you know, how do we go from that for some of us who are live streaming or, you know, are there in person and you're just listening in a sense. Um, it's how do we bring back that joy, you know, uh, together and, 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 and the confidence, uh, especially um, for those who aren't singing, especially um, if you haven't been for a while, you know, we lose part of our range or, you know, when we don't warm up in these, how, how can we warm up our congregations um, safely and, and confidently to bring back their voices? Um, and that, that that's something, um, you know, will be unique to every congregation, their heart song that, you know, maybe it's something just in unison that will just feel that sense of unification, something familiar, uh, you know, to start out. Um, it's really about just bringing back that that joy again. But, you know, uh, always being aware that we're always not trying to rush things right away to create some sort of uh, normalcy. Um, you know, people are still going to be carrying that emotional baggage when they when they come, you know, but um, we, we need to continue to encourage, you know, to lead with not just, you know, our heads, but our hearts as well. Um, figuring out, you know, how what rebuilding will look like, right? So, you know, um, that, that, that even uh, singer to singer for a choir instance, that kind of relationship, you know, little things like uh, being able to express themselves safely again. Um, and so that that's something we're definitely thinking about um, in terms of transition is to have this kind of task force team, music team that will, uh, you know, which incorporates COVID team members and, and congregation and worship members where we can figure out ways for our congregation to incorporate music safely. Not everything will be coming back all at once. And we are aware of that in our situation. And so uh, figuring out, you know, how can we bring that joy back? So Cynthia, are, are you are you all uh, at Discipleship Ministers offering any advice to the folks out of the field on how to manage the, the pastoral challenges and the musical challenges and the and the um, and the um, technological challenges that they're facing uh, going forward? You're on mute, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said that you're on mute. So sorry. Uh, yes, we we amps, that is the work of of the worship team at Discipleship Ministries. Uh, our our task is to hear from the practitioners and to hear how it is that they're uh, struggling. What are the struggles and what questions can we engage them? We don't have every answer. We can certainly engage uh, those practitioners in conversations 
it's really been good to talk to them via podcasts, uh, via um, emails, uh, so that they tell us what it is that uh, they're needing. A lot of um, a lot of uh, local churches are joining together to uh, strengthen what they do have, so that they're not singularly trying to to create a a vital experience. Uh, I think w one of the things that I continue to say to to those who are, are still practicing and who are struggling through uh, this time of uh, possibly reopening or re, re be, new beginnings, I would say, um, just, just to, to remind those who, who are trying to figure out what do I do when people are coming through the doors uh, to ask the, I think the really uh, most important question and that is, how can we create an experience? Because that's really, Michael, what people are looking for, more of an experience than a, a worship bulletin, more of a, how is it that I get to meet Jesus? Um, and when you leave, what, what was it that um, I received that really enables me to go on an yet another day? Uh, so we 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 spend a lot of time dealing with the practical issues, but spiritual formation is, I think, sort of uh, at the helm of the, the answer. And unless we really get serious about going back to the basics in terms of uh, uh, understanding the spiritual side mm -hmm. of uh, worship and how it is that we get back to Jesus. And how Jesus really becomes the, the neighbor and the friend and the words of our songs come as a result of our encounter and experience with Jesus. So uh, at the risk of sounding like a preacher, um, I just hope <laughs> and I pray that we will be, be serious about how our spiritual lives are formed, even as we're trying to figure out how many bells are left in what how we get them cleaned and how we tune the piano and so forth and so on. Always remember Jesus and going back to this Psalm, uh, you know, I, I just, the strangers who will come, who've been listening to us and now they're present among us. How is it that they will, how, when they leave, what will they say? What will they have experienced? And will they be able to say, have not our hearts, burned within while the strangers walked with us along the, the wayside. I, I don't know. Hey, preach it. I, 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 I'm, I think that's great. Um, I, you know, you, you made me think of uh, something that I heard on Saturday. Uh, there was a, um, on weekend edition uh, uh, on NPR, they had a, a, a story from Sacramento where they had been doing some studies of uh, how people's faith has been affected by the pandemic. And what they found was that people's faith is actually stronger. Yes. And I think that came across as sort of a surprise. And yeah. I, I wonder how, you know, Jonathan, how, have you, what, what, how, do, how do you think the pandemic has affected faith in the community that you're serving? I think the, it makes it stronger because, uh, you know, uh, you know, for our Latino and our African American uh, parishioners, you know, faith, culture, ethnic identity is so uh, interwoven. So even if they, you know, uh, for faith is not so much a set of doctrines or beliefs, but it's like a way of life. So, so it doesn't matter whether they go to church every Sunday or maybe once a month, because, you know, uh, culturally, you know, you know, uh, we don't, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a Western enlightenment model that when we think of faith, the very Protestant model that faith is a set of doctrines you believe, and you because you believe you go to church. It doesn't work that way. So, so for you know, uh, for the Latinos, for the African Americans, you know, it's it's so much woven into culture, ethnic identity. So, and because ninety percent of our parishioners are are minorities, so uh, it's it's a it's a much different uh, experience. So. You know, doing being church is as much the food pantries we run, 
uh, because we also run neighborhood food pantries and at those food pantries we also do things like you know prayers and bible study or what other the kind of assorted uh, learning activities we have uh, podcasts we have prayer meetings so we have always been doing you know you know we, we talk about different ways of doing church but we are still fixated on having to uh, gather in a in a building now because this 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 is important because you know uh we often think that north america is the center of the universe and how we do church is the way it is but because uh, i grew up in asia i came here i'm now a naturalized u.s citizen but one of the areas i study is migration so and i study migration in asia and uh, basically you know um, uh, migrant workers especially catholics and others who work across Asia, like, you know, we have huge population of Filipino Catholics, Indian Catholics working, say, in the Middle East. So, like, Saudi Arabia has 1.5 million Catholics, but it, it cannot build a single Catholic church. So, for years and years, the way that they go for, they do their Sunday Mass and stuff is online, YouTubes, WhatsApp groups, and stuff. So, in other words, things that the U.S. experienced last year, in Asia, in Dubai, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, you name it. They have been doing it for, you know, what, decades. You know, I was talking to Chito Tagle, you know, the then Archbishop of Manila, who is now the prefect for the congregation of, for, it, for, the, for the evangelization of peoples. And that's what they've been doing. So in other words, what all you are talking here that you've been doing in the last 12 years, churches have been doing in asia whether it's catholic or evangelical or pentecostal have been doing simply because if you cannot build a physical church in saudi arabia or in some middle eastern countries how are you going to gather the communities so ecclesiology has always been virtual as as some of my colleagues and i who do uh ethnography of catholics and migration and faith and being church and liturgy has have shown it's just that nobody pays attention to asia because we are in the middle of nowhere and 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 being catholic or being christian is europe and north america i think what COVID has done what the pandemic has done is to reveal that hey you know other parts of the world have been doing it and now you are doing it for the first time and you have to reinvent the wheel but you know everybody else has been doing that you know sometimes you know uh and uh and uh so uh so you know so on so Part of what I bring to my parish by virtue of it is because I know how things have been done in Asia. So one of the one of the fortunate things for, for the Church of Our Savior is many of these things I learned have been done in Asia, we could do it in Cincinnati. Uh, because, you know, I know how it's done, say, uh, by the Koreans and the Filipinos who have been who have been live streaming the Sunday masses for years to Korean Catholics and Filipino Catholics, say, in Saudi Arabia. So, so, so one of the yeah. things I'm hearing you say is that um, that the the uh, changes that uh, that we look forward to perhaps are not it. You know, we, we've sort of we, we we need to. I'm wondering, do we need to think big about what's going to be different going forward? I mean, right now, you know, we we've had we've sort of, everything's been disrupted. So, do we go when we go back? Is it going to be? back to normal or is it going to be moving forward into something new uh, and, and i'm wondering kate what, do you, what you're hearing about that uh, yeah it's you know i love the analogy that cynthia brought to us about the bird who travels forward while looking back and i'm finding myself doing a lot of that in the middle of the pandemic and as, as you mentioned at the beginning i'm catholic i come from a catholic um uh, perspective and even sitting right here in front of me i have I have this rosary and I am not, you know, I'm, I'm a millennial Catholic, but I'm not a typical rosary praying Catholic, but in the absence of yeah. my brothers and sisters and, and in our traditions and our patterns and that experience of breathing in the same room as people at the same time as people yeah. and singing with the same rhythm and pulses. And, and, you know, even our science tells us that it syncs our heartbeats together in the absence of those things. I'm looking for all of these other parts of my tradition that I can literally sense, I can touch it and taste it and smell it and, and hear it. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for these ways to put my faith and my practices in my body. Yeah. Um, 
So I've looked back at what, what's available in my tradition and I brought it forward with me. And, and now this will mean something to me even when I can continue to go back to my church because this is the, a thing, the tool that's helping me get through this time. And I think about that too, um, you know, in, in the absence of being able to breathe and sing and rhythm and, and sync with people, this absence is also teaching us something important. So we're taking this memory of absence with us together when we come, come together again. So we won't be the same and we shouldn't be the same when we get, when we get together again. Um, and that's because this experience has changed us in, in ways that have been painful and in ways that have created new opportunities for us, I think. Um, and, um, you know, that's, that's, um, that's important to me because I'm coming from, and I don't mean to speak for everyone, but I'm coming from a tradition where I, I see lots of disappointment in what's happening in my faith tradition and even in my church. And, you know, we can have the dwindling numbers conversation forever in, on the, the white and Western side of Christianity. But, you know, like Jonathan is saying, we, we're invited now to, <laughs> to look if there were ever a time, mm -hmm. look bigger than ourselves, to look bigger than our own country and to together globally be united by this experience yeah. of separation and absence and learn from, from one another. Mike, I, yeah, I, please. I, um, I didn't want us to finish without acknowledging also the fact that we have not been plagued and troubled by one pandemic. My staff and my, my team and I were in a meeting earlier today. And uh, we, we are trying our best to expand uh, what we understand to be the, the kingdom building process. And to build a kingdom is to, see, I, one of our main themes at the board is see all the people. This kingdom building process really re it requires that our lenses be expanded beyond the temple of our familiar. But I wanted to remind us that we are not plagued over this year with just one pandemic, but two. Uh, and, and I don't want us to leave without acknowledging the fact that that second pandemic is, is killing too. Uh, and it's killing conspicuously. Uh, and you mentioned it earlier, Mike, um, with, as we watched the trial, uh, that death is uh, ravaging the land. Uh, which is why we must really sort of hold on to that which is beyond outside of our humanness. Uh, so uh, I just didn't want us to end our time without at least acknowledging that racism is that second pandemic. Absolutely. And I, I, I appreciate you circling us back to that because I, I think that that's something that we need to talk about also as moving forward. Um, how how will we be changed to face that in a more deliberate way going forward and um, allowing ourselves to be changed yeah. as, as communities? Um, what are you seeing? What, 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 do you see, what do you foresee? Well, the, you know, the, I love these, these, um, these categories that you challenged us with returning and inclusion and polarization, et cetera. Um, and I, I, I think that we have an opportunity here. The idea, uh, uh, Jonathan talked about um, the missional part of, of the community. We have opportunity, we have an amazing opportunity as uh, the people gather under the umbrella of uh, worship. We have an amazing opportunity to speak to poverty, to speak to, uh, um, the, the, the fact that people are still trying to live, they're not jumping over fences just for the heck of it. They're trying to live. They're, it's a, it's a, they're in a survival mode. Uh, so why can't churches be focused there? Not so much um, where they're gonna get the music from, but you know, because the music, they gotta sing in, in order to survive. It's, a, it's a, cathars a catharsis of the soul. That's how music functions. We ought to be able to sing, and especially since people are hungry and, and people are not sure where they're gonna live and people are dying and 
we better have a song <laughs> to to continue this journey. We got to have a song. So, 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 so I'm, I'm sorry. No, I'm wondering about that in light of, you know, Martin Luther King's famous uh, observation that 10 yeah. o'clock Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America. Yeah. Uh, how, how then, you know, what, what, are, what are the ways in which we can be singing together? And I, I mean that in the big sense, you know, yeah. not just in the, in the sense of our own little communities. Uh, anybody have a thought on that? I don't mean to keep butting in, but <laughs> the Hymn Society is uh, this year looking at a conversation, right? In, in the theme for the, this year's uh, conference. And I, um, I'm excited about what we come away with via that theme. What, what, what is it that uh, we will say about being hospitable? in our song how is it that we will sing the people back together again what what is it that we will take away from that conversation that will enable us uh, to to speak again to this idea of welcoming through song music can do that like nothing else and the, the ways in which it and i keep going back to my own context because uh, African Americans in the Africana church has always understood that legacy, that the richness of that legacy. And if there's not a song that says to the stranger uh, in, in the midst, you're welcome here, then we, we may want to start again, mm. <laughs> especially for those who don't know the song, right? I think... Um... You know, I, it's, it's a tough, <laughs> tough conversation to have, but I feel compelled to, you know, call myself out and my, you know, white brothers and sisters out um, or call in or whichever language you, mm -hmm. you choose to use. But um, we have a tendency as um, white American people <laughs> to um, really struggle to you know, divorce ourselves from being the center of the conversation, the center of the song. And so even when we think about singing a welcome, what we think is that we, white America, are welcoming everyone else. And I'm, I'm really, I'm, I think what's compelling is if we try to flip our minds, my white brothers and sisters, flip our minds to, like, there is life there is more life in the diversity of our church of our nation in the the the, the worshiping people of of color in our nation that that part of our church and our our faith communities they're growing they don't have the same you know narrative of decline like the white church in, in america has and it's really that diverse voice that's welcoming us that's taking us white people with them into the future but our minds are still fixated on this idea and I, I it's reinforced by all kinds of things in our community and our society and our politics um, that we're the center and so I would I would challenge us going forward to try to convince ourselves that we're not I'm wondering uh, Matthew are you having that conversation in your congregation Hmm. No, I was just thinking about what Kate was saying, you know, how do we shift that yeah. idea of the center to this more spectrum, you know, um, that, you know, it's not just uh, this aspect here. Um, but yeah, just thinking about singing welcome, um, you know, thinking about the uh, effects of, uh, you know, what Black Lives Matter means um, to a white uh, major uh, majority congregation here. Um, what does it mean to sing welcome um, and you know the what happened to George Floyd of course uh, these are some of the important topics we have with our own uh, not just our own congregation but within our own com uh, committees and you know councils and and just how do we take that step further rather you know there were interesting things um, that we've been trying to uh, to, to to start and continue 
uh, as we go with this conversation, one of the things that we have um, started was this kind of like anti, like, yeah, how can we approach things in an anti-racist way uh, through worship planning? Um, you know, the things that we, you know, whether that's picking hymns or, or conversations you're having, we've been trying to take the approach, you know, the anti-racist approach of things. And one of the ways we've also uh, formed an anti-racist grandparenting group. Um, and this was kind of open to grandparents, aunts, uncles, neighbors, you know, anyone else who's spends time with children and youth, you know, there's been quite a bit of resources lately about anti-racist parenting, but it's not just up to the parents, right? So um, this was an opportunity to discuss, share ideas and resources about how we bring anti-racism into being an expanded circle of care for the young people in our lives. Um, you know, so we're planning to also have another meeting um, later in this year as well. Um, but these are just some ways how we are trying to educate and continue to, I, I know we're just kind of, you know, there's, there's no ending to this. This is just a, a journey for us that we are on at the moment. Mm -hmm. and, and so they're, they're, we, we've been trying to uplift, you know, these uh, minority individuals and these voices and, and ways to um, think about defunding the police has been a, an, you know, a conversation in our, in our worship committees as well. So, well, gosh, there are just so many intersections that, yeah. that we have, uh, we can uh, name, uh, but I think we're probably gonna need to start to bring our conversation to a close. And I, I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to kind of talk about um, something that you really hope for, uh, for the churches, uh, for singing communities uh, is, uh, going forward uh, as, we, uh, as we see things changing uh, back to more in-person contact and in-person singing and in-person worship. So uh, Jonathan, you want to take a stab at that? Okay, let, okay let, I mean, uh, let me echo what Cynthia has, has said. I mean, and, and, and because our, my parish is Black Lives Matter and refugees. So uh, police shooting just affect our community as well as immigrants. And, and so, so we cannot talk about church without talking about Black Lives Matter and immigrant lives matters, you know, and that we have to let our let people Americans know that immigrants are not just criminals or out to steal or our way of life or whatever, but you know that they, they, they flee from Guatemala because you know you know you know they just cannot survive there you know and so the, how does that translate into church life, community life, singing, liturgy? you know what worked for our parish is you know, learning each other's songs. You know, our, our African-American parishioners will sing Canta El Señor as enthusiastically as the Latinos. And our Latinos can sing uh, Heroes, They Crucify My Savior, because we, we have translated all this. So, so like, you know, Heroes, They Crucify My Savior. We have, we have bilingual lyrics now that we, we do in-house translations. So, so that, you know, they can sing that, you know, our, our, African American parishioners can sing, you know, the the Cordero de Dios from Misa Mariachi, the classic uh, Lamb of God setting that just about every Latino knows, as enthusiastically in Spanish as the Latinos, and vice versa. So one of the things is music is universal. Uh, we have to do the hard work. We're not we cannot wait for GIA or OCP to always translate everything. Uh, so we have in-house. Uh, we do our in-house translations of things that they are not that, that we don't find uh, in uh, Oremos uh, Cantando uh, or Flor y Canto. Uh, we teach. We learn. I mean, so I mean, if you know people learn to sing Silent Night in English, like still it now. There's no reason why you cannot learn to sing. You know some of the Latino songs. You know, go back and forth singing. You know, like how they do. We have done things like this. You sing simultaneously English, Spanish, the way we do at, at Daisy. You no, know, there are so many models. It's just that I think, as Kate pointed out, in North America at least, I mean, coming here is there is these expectations of a, a normative way of doing liturgy, a normative way of doing liturgical music that uh, we have to disrupt. So, so like you know, uh, you know, I came in, I came in the nineteen nineties, you know, when Bob Hood was doing Misa de las Americas. Jonathan, Jonathan I'm, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you there because we're, right. we're we're running out of time, and I want to make All sure right, we well, get to everybody else. But okay, thank you. Okay, for, I'll stop you for that unshared. 
Uh, Matthew, how about you? What do you what do you, what would you like to see going forward uh, uh, as we come back together? I think when we can, you know, safely return into in-person worship, it's important to still continue to find ways to, you know, foster that community we started online. Um, that could mean live streaming, you know, so it is still accessible, especially for folks who are just not as comfortable to return or, or uh, you know, are, are afraid to return right away yet. Um, so maybe that's also uh, thinking of uh, the importance of getting outdoors, right? Maybe for walks and fresh air. If you haven't done so, maybe taking worship outdoors. Um, this, for some who are afraid to walk in the church buildings, maybe it, it's a way for them to feel welcomed if it were outdoors. Um, I think as church leaders, we should also consider thinking, you know, who has been missing from our table and absent all this time during the pandemic. Um, you know, I find this article from my friend and colleague, uh, Miriam Spee's very helpful to read. I can put it in um, the chat here. It talks sure. about, you know, uh, COVID exposing Christian ableism, you know, what happens when churches reopen and how can we reach out to those first that have been missing all this time. Um, I'll just put that in quickly here. For uh, I, and I, I, I recommend that article because I, you, you shared it with our group earlier and I, I found that to be very provocative. It's very good. Thank you for it. Um, yeah, and just, I guess, you know, our congregants, we believe that I, at the moment, you know, that it's, it's not just enough to talk about welcome and inclusion, right? So uh, it's not just enough to be nice that, you know, anyone who walks through our physical or virtual doors, it's, it's not enough to look at, you know, those of us who are Black or people of color and are valued and loved as part of our community and decide the work is done, right? So we believe, you know, we must continue to engage in the work of being anti-racist. To do so, you know, is one of those most faithful things we can do right now as Easter people. So these are just some of the thoughts that um, we're, we're definitely, uh, you know, taking forward with us. Thank you so much, Matthew. Kate, what would you like to see us? Yeah, well, I'm, see us I'm just thinking as, you know, I'm so enjoying being with all of you and talking. I wish we could have like a every week coffee hour together. That would be, <laughs> <laughs> <That'd> be great. <laughs> but I'm just thinking, you know, my, my Catholic perspective has, it tells me that liturgy and liturgical singing, congregational singing, is an act of truth telling. And it's an act of remembering. It's telling who we are, where we've come from, what we've been through. Um, um, and we're gonna need to take with us, I think, um, the story of, or the song yeah. of what's happening to us right now. And we need to proclaim that song into our future and do all the things that we do in our communities, make meaning of, of it and, and, and relate it to scripture and theologize what's happening to us. Um, but we're gonna need to take that with us. And so I'm thinking as we go forward, what I want most from people is please don't forget what is happening to us now, how we are being changed now, what we have lost and what we have gained. Please don't forget. Awesome, thank you. And Cynthia. What Kate said. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah, I, I just uh, <laughs> I just love it, and I and I think that uh, I, I feel so deeply that our, our hearts are, are so on one accord, and I pray that this has been helpful for the listening audience. Um, I really have to say how much I appreciate the work of the Hem Society and the ways in which the Hem Society is being attentive. I, I love the way that the, the leaders, the leadership, the fellowship, that, that they're listening and that they recognize, we are recognizing uh, that we, you know, we've come a long way, but we've got a little ways to go. So the de decolonial uh, work, the process must continue. The, the decentering must continue. And it is the story, Kate. People love to hear, uh, the, the hymn writer said, I love to tell the story. The psalmist love telling the story. People love sitting and listening to the story. And in each of our contexts, it's the story that gets us through the day and that connects our lives. To speak of the pain, to, to tell the truth and to acknowledge the pain, but then to also recognize that there's a way out, there's a bomb in Gilead. Amen. Well, th th thank you. I just don't know how to say 
thank you enough to the four of you for having this conversation today. Uh, yeah. And uh, it gives me a lot of hope for, um, it also makes me realize how much work we have left to do to, uh, to uh, as we uh, work uh, together uh, yeah. in the future. Um, with a couple of questions that we didn't get to, and I, I just I just kind of want to acknowledge those. Uh, Jackie Jones was asking us about uh, the the shock that's likely to occur, you know, when we we all start start singing together again after uh, singing in isolation from one another, but together, uh, and uh, what kind of process we're going to need to, to do that. Uh, we don't really have time to deal with that, but I think that's a, a very thought provoking question. So um, thank you uh, for the for the uh, for the questions and for the comments that we got in the chat. Um, thank you to all of you for this. Um, there's going to be a webinar next Monday as part of our ambassador series. It's the last one in that series also, and uh, it's uh, Jonathan Hain. So, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a name of some import in the hymn society, uh, the Hain name, and uh, <laughs> to, to follow them. And so if, you, if you're not signed up for that, check, check our website, you can, you can find that. And as we've mentioned a couple of times during the uh, webinar today, our uh, our annual conference this summer uh, is uh, entitled Singing Welcome with a Question Mark because uh, that statement raises more questions than it, than it uh, answers, right? So uh, yeah. we're, I think we're gonna have some really good um, events uh, to explore that theme and to kind of help us do just the kinds of things that uh, uh, Cynthia mentioned just now. So again, thank you, uh, Kate. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Cynthia. And thanks to all of you for being with us today. Um, blessings to you and, and to all those you serve as, as we, as we uh, are, be church together. Bye-bye. <laughs>